Hello, students, faculty, and staff for Maricopa Community Colleges. My name is Dr. Kimberly Smith. I am a chemistry professor at Glendale Community College. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about acid rain and ocean acidification. So indulge me just a minute in telling you a little bit about what acids are. So acids are chemicals that when you put them in water, a hydrogen ion, H, breaks off and floats around in the water. And it's the H plus ions that are acidic. So the more hydrogen ions there are, the more acidic your solution will be. And the more acidic you are, the lower your pH. In many places, rain and bodies of water are becoming more acidic. This is largely due to higher emissions of CO2 in our environment called carbon emissions, but we really mean CO2. CO2, carbon dioxide, and other greenhouse gases that I abbreviate GHG, are warming our world and causing climate change, which is why we even have Earth Week, right? I'm sure you've heard a little bit about climate change this week already. So greenhouse gases come from burning coal and natural gas, fossil fuels. They come from vehicles using gasoline, and the meat industry, meat production, also produces a lot of greenhouse gases. And again, those are warming our world and causing climate change, which is not a very good thing. So speaking of pH, it is a scale that goes from 0 to 14 and measures how acidic or basic something is. If you have a swimming pool, you may test the pH of your swimming pool periodically. So in the middle of the pH scale is the number seven. So seven is actually neutral. It's not acidic or basic. Now, if you look at my little picture, you can see rainwater is around 5.3 and ocean or seawater is around eight. So I'm gonna be mentioning pHs during my talk. So I just wanted to show you what the pH scale looks like. Seven is neutral. As we go towards zero or lower, we're getting more acidic. As we go towards 14 or higher, we're getting basic. So how does the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide, CO2, make water acidic anyway? Did you know tap water is actually a little bit acidic? It's not neutral. And that's just because all the CO2 in the air can dissolve a little bit in water. So I have a chemical equation there, CO2, plus H2O, which is water, makes H2CO3, which is an acid, carbonic acid. So carbonic acid then will lower the pH of the water, whether it's rainwater or water in a lake or water in the ocean, the CO2 we're putting into the air is combining with that water and making carbonic acid, which again is making things more acidic. So let's talk a little bit about acid rain. The pH of normal rain is about 5.3. It is a little acidic, again, because there's CO2 mixing with the water in the clouds and making carbonic acid. But we're seeing rain now with pH below 5, like 4.5, even 4, sometimes in the threes. And that's acid rain because it's not normal. So we've been collecting rain samples since about 1970 all across the United States and Canada. So we have lots of data. Why is the rain becoming acidic? Well, not only does CO2 react with water and make an acid, but burning fossil fuels creates other gases that we call SOX and NOx. SOX is where the X stands for a two or three, so SO2 or SO3 gases. And then NOx stands for gases NO and NO2. And those four gases, can react with water vapor in the clouds and make acids like sulfurous acid, sulfuric acid, nitrous acid, and nitric acid. So NOx and SOx are short, and that's shorthand kind of, and that's what we call them in chemistry. All four of those gases are pollutants and cause acid rain. So we have all these different gases coming from fossil fuels that react with water and make acids, and then they get rained back down on us. And that's why the pH is below five. So the little picture here shows the carbon factory with burning of coal 
and the smoke goes up and we have sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides being released into the atmosphere, carried around by the wind till they reach a rain cloud. The gases dissolve in that rain water and form acid rain, which rains back down on us. And acid rain can kill plant life, pollutes rivers and streams, and it erodes metal and stonework. So here's a map of how acidic the rain is across the United States. Red and orange is more acidic than yellow and green. So in Arizona, you may not have heard too much about acid rain because, well, we don't have a lot of rain, do we? And the rain we do have is not that acidic. But if you ever lived in the Northeast, whew, they have problems with acid rain. So you might hear it more if you are traveling in the northeastern part of the United States. Southern California, however, hasn't been exempt from acid rain. In January 1982, Pasadena, which is a suburb of L.A., had a pH in their fog that was about 2.5. That's pretty acidic. Later that same year, another suburb of L.A., Corona del Mar, had a fog that pH was 1.5. Remember, the closer you get to zero, the more acidic we are. So their concentrations of sulfur dioxide were pretty low. So you might think, well, L.A. has a lot of traffic and they have a lot of pollution. Well, there's not a lot of sulfur and gasoline for those of you who know about cars. But we have nitrogen in the air that gets sucked into gasoline engines and produces the gas NO. Coal plants also emit tons of NO. So it's the NO that combines with the water in the clouds and produces these really low pH fogs. So 35% of the gas NO comes from coal plants. 58%, however, comes for transportation. So it is all the cars in LA that's causing rise to their acidic rain and fogs. So cities that have a lot of traffic may have more acid rain than out in the rural areas. The effects of acid rain. Well, the acid rain can react with some metals. Iron, in particular, reacts with acids. And guess what? We make bridges and railroads and vehicles and fences and steel rods and ships and buildings all out of iron. Iron will rust faster in the presence of the acid. We actually spend billions of our tax dollars every year to protect iron that's exposed by painting and coating it. So these bridges and railroads and uh, fences and buildings, we have to protect that iron and it costs a lot of money uh, of our tax dollars and corporate dollars. Marble and stone also dissolve slowly in acid. So gravestones, eventually you can't read them anymore. Or maybe there's a famous marble statue sitting outside. If it's getting acid rain on it, it's gonna slowly dissolve away and we'll lose that precious statue or work of art. So we're losing great works of art and historic landmarks by the acid rain. Acid rain also produces problems with visibility. It produces haze. Haze is when you have little droplets suspended in the air and sulfuric acid can make such droplets which scatter sunlight and cause haze. Now breathing these little droplets is not good. It causes lung damage and drives up healthcare costs. So we really need to reduce our SOX and NOx gases. If we did that, we would save billions of dollars in health care. So coal plant plants do a lot of the pollution, but individuals have to pay their own health care costs. Is this equitable? That's something to think about. That's just a picture of what haze looks like. Makes everything hard to see. So that's not a dust storm. That's just from haze. Acid rain also causes damage to lakes and streams. So humans aren't the only species that are being damaged by acid rain. A healthy lake has a pH of about 6.5, very close to seven, so close to neutral. Below a pH of six, damage starts to occur. The lake, the lake is mostly dead by a pH of five, and it's completely dead by a pH of four. Now, luckily in the Midwest, lakes contains limestone, which neutralizes acid, but New England's not so lucky. Their lakes are becoming more acidic. Many of them are dying and you can't go fishing like you used to. So you hear complaints about that. Acid rain also damaged forests. Now you may look at that and say, well, that's a forest fire. No, that's acid rain damage. So acid rain can kind of 
um, cause damage to the trees by increasing the chance of an insect infestation. It increases their susceptibility to drought. It impairs their growth. Um, it also damages the soil by leaching uh, nutrients away from it. So acid rain also can kill uh, plants and trees. All right, let's shift gears and talk a little bit now about the ocean getting more acidic. So in the ocean, we have coral reefs and they're dying. You may have heard of that. In fact, about 25% of them are already dead. And again, it goes back to our CO2 emissions. The ocean is becoming warmer and more acidic because of all the CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere. Ocean acidification is often called climate change's nasty little sibling. And the oceans absorb about 30% of the CO2 that we produce. And again, there's that chemical equation again. The CO2 that we produce plus water makes that H2CO3, that carbonic acid. So some facts. CO2 levels are higher than any time in the past 800,000 years. In fact, we've recently passed 420 parts per million in our atmosphere. Whereas before the Industrial Revolution, we were around 280. So humans have caused that large of an increase. We're up to 420 now. CO2 levels are increasing at a faster rate than any time in the past 800,000 years. So CO2 levels have gradually gone up and down and up and down, but the rate's very mild. Right now, we are going up at a fast rate, very steep curve. So that's faster than anything in the past 800,000 years. Large areas of coral have been bleached, which means they're dead. They turn white, so they call it bleaching. The ocean is about 30% more acidic than it was before the Industrial Revolution. 30% more acidic, wow. Here's a picture of healthy coral supporting fish. It looks pretty. People want to go and snorkel there for tourism, which gives rise to hotels and restaurants and shopping and creates a really nice village for tourism. However, if that healthy coral turns into bleached coral, you're gonna go visit that? No. So not only did the coral die, all the fish that feed off of it die, the tourism dies, and then that village, everyone's out of a job. So lots of things happen when the coral bleaches. So here's a graph showing where coral can grow in 1880. The blue and yellow zones are adequate for coral growth. Orange and red, not so much. Well, here's where we were in 2000. That blue-ish green color had shrunken a lot, and the yellow is getting closer to the equator, and the orange and red are increasing. Well, here's where we're going to be in 2050. That's only 30 years from now. So most of those coral reefs are going to die if we're in our kefirol. So what is happening to our oceans? Again, it's that water absorbing the CO2 gas and making carbonic acid, which increases those hydrogen plus ions in the water, so the pH goes down as we get more acidic. The ocean pH has gone down about 0.1. That may not sound like much, but pH is a logarithmic scale. So since the 1800s, we've had about a 30% increase in H plus ions in our oceans. Predicted by 2050, the pH will go down by 0.23, by 2100, we predict it'll go down by 0.36 if nothing is done. So the pH of the ocean is a little basic at 8.2. It's just now, it was 8.2, and now it's gone down to 8.1. Sorry about the dogs. Pandemic. So ocean acidification affects shelled animals, little animals with shells. They dissolve when we get more acidic. See, the CO2 with the water and these carbonate ions come out of the shells and make bicarbonate. So when we have more acidic waters, it makes it harder for these shelled animals to keep the shells intact. So why does it matter if the ocean becomes more acidic? Well, we've seen corals die. We've seen these little shelled animals also will lose their shells, and that's not good for them. So corals, echinoderms, crustaceans, pteropods, and mollusks all care because it gets harder for them to live and form their shells. It takes more energy. 
all the animals that live off the coral reefs will be threatened as well. And so that just disrupts the whole ocean food chain all the way up to humans. So here's what pteropods look at in case you were wondering. They're little, they're called sea butterflies. Sea butterflies, they're really cute. Echinoderms are starfish, sand dollar, sea cucumber, sea urchins. Crustaceans are shrimp, lobsters, crabs. And mollusks are things like clams, nautilus, snails. So there's consequences to making the ocean more acidic. All the animals that live off the coral will be threatened also. This will disrupt the food chain. Scientists predict that within 30 years, shells are going to start to be dissolving, including the coral reefs. In fact, the Great Barrier Reef is already undergoing slower growth in Australia. They're having trouble up there with the Great Barrier Reef. Coral reefs protect coastlines from rough waters and hurricanes and provide homes for many species. So all of this is going to affect the humans involved in tourism and the fishing industry. Again, no one wants to go scuba or snorkel at a dead coral reef. Fishermen are already complaining of decreased fish in the ocean due to many reasons, but climate change and ocean acidification play a major role. So what can you do? Well, we need to reduce our carbon emissions, CO2. So we need to use less fossil fuel electricity, meaning we should advocate for green energy like solar, wind, geothermal. Uh, that's a picture of my backyard, actually, and our solar panels that we installed about eight years ago and really cut down on our electricity costs. And it provides all the energy for our home from those solar panels. Other things we can do, reduce using gasoline powered cars. So drive less, advocate for electric cars and public transportation. Recycle everything you can that's recyclable and make sure you do a good job of it and clean it. Also, eating less meat's a great idea. Go meatless on Mondays, meatless Mondays or more. So vote for politicians that support these green energies, recycling, vote to save our planet. Well, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you have a wonderful Earth Week this week. Bye-bye.